This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. It's only by pulling together that we can overcome adversity and triumph against extraordinary odds. I'm William Shatner. Tonight on Rescue 911, true stories of men, women, and children who have joined together to face the toughest moments of their lives. We begin on January 11th, 1992 in Peru, Vermont, where Alan Post was enjoying a weekend ski trip with his 21-year-old son, Casey, and some friends. Casey was an excellent skier, and the same thing transformed into this snowboarding. He always did everything sort of on the extreme, on the edge. I hate to say this, but it was an accident waiting to happen at some point in his life. Casey's college friend, Jenny Michaels, was skiing Bromley Mountain with them that day. Casey is a very exuberant personality, and he just has an innate talent for anything when it comes to, like, physical type of activities. People turn around on the lifts and watch him go by. He definitely has the finesse and the flair on his snowboard. I right, did that last time. Oh, we did that last time? Let's go corkscrew. Okay, let's go corkscrew, okay? went shooting down, and then we started to follow him. Casey wanted to go on a different run, so we separated. And we were all gonna meet in for lunch. Carol Allen was on her way up the mountain on the ski lift. And I noticed coming down the corkscrew trail, a snowboarder. He was skiing the outside, right on the edge of the trail. He was trying to pass everybody. He was picking up incredible speed, and I thought, this guy's going to get hurt. Jim Midhofer and several other members of the Bromley Mountain Ski Patrol happened to be training nearby. We were running a ski clinic, just practicing brushing up on skills. streak out of the corner of my eye and there were some other people above us who said help we need help there's been a bad accident patrolling the ski patrol we saw a person over the bank just below two the skier it almost looked like he was having sort of final rigors of death when we continue. They were trying to give off the impression that everything was fine, that they kept trying to keep calm, but it was so obvious that the energy in the air that there was something serious had happened. Can you hear me?
When Casey Post snowboarded off the side of a trail into a ravine, members of the Bromley Mountain Ski Patrol, including senior patrol member Tom Cutbush, happened to be on a training exercise less than 50 yards away. As I approached the victim, there was a lot of blood behind the victim's head. I knew the victim had bounced his head off of a rock. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Lo and behold, there's a pause of just a few seconds, and I hear a faint yes. Okay, great. Listen, my name's Tom from the Ski Patrol. The main thing I was concerned about was the integrity of his cervical spine. Tom took over the probably manual traction. Is that sore? Yeah. Just keep talking to him. That was our most important mission, to keep him in that position. Yeah. There was a lot of blood building up on my left mitten because of the injury to the back of the head. He also kept saying to me a number of times that he was scared. And I said, it's okay to be scared, but you don't have to be. Jim and I are here. Okay, down. One, two, three, down. Okay, okay. Real good, real good. Nice. After the straps are put on, it was absolutely right. mandatory that this be as tight as possible without cutting off circulation so the victim did not move at all. ETA, three minutes. At the lodge at the bottom of the slopes, Casey's father and Jenny Michaels were waiting for him, unaware of what had happened. I wonder where Casey is. I just have the feeling that something it, like, was wrong because we were all meant to be down there having lunch. And there was no Casey. into the first aid building. That was really when I felt like my heart was stopped because they were trying to give off the impression that everything was fine, that they kept trying to keep calm. But it was so obvious that the energy in the air that there was something terrible and serious had happened. Anybody heard from the ambulance yet? I knew there was something wrong with his head, obviously, because there was a lot of blood. It was excruciating to think that your son might be a quadriplegic. That was just... That went through my mind. I was so nervous and scared to go over to Casey. We both had that one second of contact between our eyes, and we both started to cry. Bedford Road. That ambulance here yet? 21 year old Casey Post was transported 40 miles to Rutland Regional Medical Center and put under the care of neurosurgeon Peter Upton. It was quite apparent that Casey had some very severe and potentially life threatening injuries. How about your head? Um, it doesn't really he had a big know. cut on his scalp, what we call a depressed skull fracture. I mean, there was a piece of bone that was actually pushed in. Inside the skull, there's a piece of bone that's just broken off there, and that's going to need to be pulled back out, and, and so we can relieve the pressure there. And this CAT scan showed that he had a neck fracture. Here, in the front. I didn't know how seriously injured he really was until the doctor came and kind of briefed us on what the operation was going to entail. But that the risk of some brain damage was very high. Casey underwent two hours of surgery to repair his skull and stabilize his broken neck. His mother, Tanya Clark, got a chance to see him early the next morning. He was very groggy, and when you first go into his room, you can't realize that he can't turn this way or this way. He's looking up like this, and he can't move at all, so you have to come around into his face. I know, that it always seems to be the way. It was just the scariest thing I've ever been through. What would you like? His fractures were in the first and second vertebra in the neck, where the brain and the spinal cord join. And although I had him in traction and we had him in a special bed, you still have to be careful. If he tries to get out of bed with this device on, he could end up paralyzing or dying from that. Okay. Okay. He had never been cooped up in a situation like this for any period of time before in his life. As long as he was stabilized, I felt the chances were very good that he wouldn't have any permanent damage. I think, I think I'd rather live in someplace like Portland, Maine. It's been two years since the accident. 
Casey Post has made a complete recovery. I had a couple doctors tell me, a couple doctors tell mom, and there's no reason that this kid should be alive right now. Well, I think maybe they thought I was a crazy kid and that, you know, I wouldn't learn a lesson from this or I wouldn't, I wouldn't take in all this information. I was reckless, you know, I, I'll totally admit that. I was a lot more reckless and I wasn't as calculated and careful as I am now. I thank my whole family, my friends, and my doctor, Dr. Upton, and I'd really like to thank all of Bromley Ski Patrol. They're just amazing. If we hadn't gotten to him as soon as we did, he may have tried to move. I believe if he had even so much as coughed or sneezed that he probably could have displaced the fracture in his neck and would have killed himself. For their efforts in saving Casey's life, Jim Mithofer and Tom Cutbush were honored by the National Ski Patrol. The skill levels that we do teach our patrollers is very, very high. Whether it's Bromley Mountain in Vermont or it's any mountain anywhere else, we're real proud of what we do. That's a really good feeling. Yeah. I think it touched a lot of people's lives. Everybody stopped, took two steps back. A bunch of my friends sent out of, out of anybody who we know You'd be the one who'd break his neck, but you'd also be the one who'd survive. <laughs> For my birthday, he wrote me this wonderful poem and it went on and on and on about what I wanted to give you for your birthday. I couldn't put it in a box. It isn't bagels. It isn't locks. Sort of like a, a Dr. Seuss rhyme. And then it got to one point and it said, so mommy dear, to allay your fears so deep, I promise to look before I leap. Oh! <laughs> Where? Next. Arterial. It is arterial. She said that it was arterial, which means that it's spurting blood from the artery every time the heart pumps. There's quite a danger of someone bleeding to death before we could get there to help them. Oh my God. In December of 1993, 18-year-old Nicole Miller traveled to Dana Point, California, to spend Christmas with her father, Wayne, and his fiancée, Susie Breedlove. During her stay, Nicole came down with the flu and could not seem to get over it. On December 28th, before she went to bed, everyone agreed that she'd go to the doctor as soon as she got up the next morning. Nikki really didn't feel good. She didn't want to keep her sister up sleeping in the bedroom. Keep in the hospital tomorrow. Love you. She had taken some liquid night cold medication, and that really knocked her out, which we were happy for because she needed to sleep. Before Wayne could even like decide where it had come from, I was already up, put my robe on, and had ran out to the living room. Oh my God. Oh As my eyes focused, the walls were covered with blood. She was just profusely bleeding. Fire department. <gasps> my stepdaughter can't breathe. What address? There's a hole in her chest. What address is she at? 30. Orange County Fire Dispatcher Lori Fenimore took the call. I knew we were going to have to start CPR on her um, and was about to begin to walk the caller through CPR over the telephone when the patient began to breathe on her own. Okay, she's not breathing at all. No. Are you sure? Lay her flat on the floor. Yeah, get her flat on her back on the floor. Okay, how old is she? She's 17. Okay. Wait, just drag her over here. Keep going. You got her. You're okay. Oh, no. Okay. We're all right, sweetie. She's oh. bleeding to death. I remember losing it saying, 
Oh my God, not Nikki. Please, not Nikki. Oh my God, I have the paramedics on the way. I could hear some, some screaming in the background, but the caller was very calm. Put, honey, go get a towel, put pressure. Nikki, keep breathing. I thought I had, was on the point of losing her. And that was the biggest fear of my life, is losing all my children. We need to do is get a towel we are. and apply direct pressure to the wound, okay? okay? Obviously, the person on the other end of the phone was just a step ahead of me, which is good because it was such a serious call. Okay. It's arterial. It is arterial. Okay. She said that it was arterial, which means that it's spurting blood from the artery every time the heart pumps. There's quite a danger of someone bleeding to death before we could get there to help them um, if the bleeding isn't stopped. Keep breathing. You're okay. Come on, Nikki. Come on, honey. Breathe. You're okay, Daddy. Go get some pants on, Wayne. Nikki, breathe. Okay, sweetheart? It is arterial. I can just feel it pumping out. Okay. Because of how it was bleeding, I wanted them to know the severity of it. But I had just decided right then, I will not let you die. Oh, my God. Okay, she's, Let's still, die. Is she still breathing? Yeah, Nikki, you still breathing, honey? Okay. You're fine, sweetheart. You just cut your neck a little. You're all right. Oh, my God. It was hard because I was so afraid that Nikki was going to okay. catch on to the severity of what was going on. Okay. Why don't we, if you, if you can, without making the bleeding any worse, yeah. why don't you go ahead and elevate her legs and feet a little bit and try to... Wayne, elevate her legs for me, please. I was grabbing the pillows off of the couch to elevate her legs. And at that time, also noticing how much blood again yes. she had okay, lost. Honey. Oh, she's come back. It's all right, <sighs> Yeah, I thought she was gone. I was so afraid. Okay, how's she doing now? She's fine. She's resting. Her eyes are closed. Okay, you okay, good. Nick? Okay. You just lay there. You're doing a really good job at staying calm and keeping everybody else calm. Well, it's amazing. Had she not maintained direct pressure on the wound, in the time it took the paramedics to respond to drive there, the daughter would have bled to death. Within seven minutes, paramedic Skip Hawkins and his partner arrived. We walk through the door, we see blood literally everywhere. Uh, you don't expect to see this kind of scenario underneath a Christmas tree. Okay, we're going to take a look at it. Paramedic day. Eric Leverance was treating the wound. My concern was when I opened it up to take a look at it, was I going to let air into the vessel, which would cause an air embolism. And once the ambulance got there, we wanted to get going. At Mission Hospital Regional Medical Center, 18-year-old Nicole Miller was immediately rushed into surgery. Trauma surgeon Kenneth Kushner performed the delicate operation. Nicole had sustained a major laceration of the internal jugular vein. It is a very high flow vein, and clearly if it's allowed to continue to keep bleeding, the patient can hemorrhage severely. Let's see what we got when we get in there. Okay. Oh, I'm scared to death, hoping everything is going to go all right. Scared to death because she had lost so much blood. Both of us started crying again, not knowing what was going on. With the big fear that someone's going to come and say she didn't make it. Although Nicole suffered massive blood loss, amazingly, within two months, she had fully recovered. Nikki goes, I don't care how bad the scar looks, I'm glad to be alive. And we all started crying. It wasn't a minor call, but it was a relatively easy procedure to do that saved her life. I mean, anybody can learn how to do direct pressure. If you just learn the basics, it helps uh, the emergency personnel tremendously. They can attribute them having a living daughter to these basic skills that they had learned and remembered and acted upon. Because if you can save your own child's life, that is the best gift of all. Okay. See? We were close before this ever happened, but it's brought us a lot closer in a lot of ways. My dad, he's the greatest guy I know. He's always there. And he really shows his love and that he cares. Let's heal up real fast. How do you express to someone how much you love her? Just show it daily. 
Susie's a very wonderful person. She's perfect for my dad. She'll make our family very happy. I mean, she already has. Susie's... Oh, there's not enough words to say how wonderful of a person she is. Curious to know what happened. It's just, if I feel it was a miracle that she's here. Right. I don't really say that to her. And I think we've proven we can make it through anything, and we will. Next. I thought it was kind of humorous. But of course, at that time, I thought, you know, it stuck to his hair, but we'll get it off. No big deal. It didn't turn out that way. Hey, what are you doing? Some emergencies are more likely to be embarrassing than fatal. At times like these, the only thing that can help save face is a sense of humor. As 22-year-old Eric Lundy of Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska found out while working with our professor Jim McClelland on April 16, 1992. Daniel, we need to sprinkle this in very gently. Two of my students, Air bubbles, Dan Potter and Eric Lundy, wanted to make masks of themselves. I guess for posterity. And so I said, well, I've done this many times before. Uh, sure, I'll help you with it. Let me check the... It's very important to apply Vaseline to any place that it could be embedded in the plaster to keep it from sticking. The final product looks as if you sculpted your face out of stone or something. I thought it'd be fun. It'd be an experience. It'd be a different art form. Okay. Because he's going to be under the plaster for roughly 15 minutes, we need to provide for free breathing during that period. Breathing comfortably? Are you? No, we're ready. It's going to be a little bit cool. Thing. Raise your left hand if you need anything. I'm going to do the eyes, so keep them closed. That's when it gets a little scary, just because you're going to be in there for 15 minutes, and the psychological part of it is, is pretty tough. If you're claustrophobic, it's not good at all. <laughs> you all right? Are you okay? All right, it's all right. This will start setting up in just a few minutes now. Okay, Dan, I think we can take this off now. When the mask was set, we began to lift the mask off gently. What do you think? What do you think it's stuck? What's the matter? On, what? Bro? On, it's stuck. Where? It's stuck in my... We said, well, where's it stuck? And he says, my forehead. It's stuck on my forehead. I'm going to lift just a little bit. The mask normally lifts off very easily, but in Eric's words, he felt like his whole scalp was going to come off. High school senior Kathy Long, who was taking classes at the college, happened to be passing by. I noticed some commotion, and I heard, stop, that hurts, don't do that, quit, it's not coming off. We're going to sit you up, Barry. And I realized that he was stuck. At the time, Kathy was training to be an EMT. I thought, maybe there's something I can do, but EMT training covers none of this, I wish. <laughs> you okay? Here, try to bend forward and it might come off. Let me try. I thought it was kind of humorous. But of course, at that time, I thought, you know, it stuck to his hair, but we'll get it off. No big deal. It didn't turn out that way. I said, you're going to look real good in the flat top. Girls may even like this mask, and you may even look better with it on. Sit straight down. down. I think he thought it was funny the first time. I don't think he thought it was funny later. And I thought, if they don't get this off, it's really going to ruin his social life. <laughs> really seriously. Oh. I just want to look down in here for a minute. As he started getting further down, I realized that, you know, it's not hair anymore. It's, it's got to be stuck to the skin. Hey, what are you doing? I was literally sweating because I felt responsible. Hey. I'm sorry. That's a big chunk. Eric did not want the mask broken. After the first 45 minutes, he said, I want this thing. I've gone through too much agony and pain to lose it, and I need one for my art class. And Mr. McClellan's like, well, I'll excuse you on this one. He's like, no, I want it. <laughs> when music teacher Lisette Deemer spotted the group, her curiosity got the better of her. Jim was using some kind of a ceramic tool that looked like a teeny-weeny spade. It must have been uncomfortable because Eric was saying, let somebody else work for a while. So I wound up doing some of the chipping. Well, I don't think we're going to make much progress this way. 
There was a little bit of a space between the hair and the cast. Let's try an X-Acto knife. Maybe we That's can... really scary when you think how sharp an X-Acto knife is. So I didn't want to proceed with that for very long. Just, you need to hold still, okay? I'll be real careful here. Just going to try and kind of slice the hair away from you. Be careful. It wasn't going too well. It seemed impossible. It was stuck completely across. What about some water? Okay, here comes water. Pour some right on the mask itself. Is that helping? No, I don't think it's helping. Let's try some cooking oil or something. Oh, all right. That's plenty of oil. Oh, man. Well, how about liquid soap? Okay. Everybody had an opinion. Everyone had an, some advice to give, you know. Everyone had a solution. Of course, none of it worked. Morgan? Uh, no. There was more than once that I thought to myself, boy, wouldn't I just love to just yank this off. It, it wouldn't kill him. <laughs> One, two, three. It's not working. But let's, let's try something else. A call for assistance brought a Lincoln Fire Engine Company to the scene. I was not aware that 911 had been called. And all of a sudden, firemen showed up. And I was just thinking to myself, what are firemen? What are they going to do, hose him down? I mean, I didn't know what they could do for him. Captain Gary Keene assessed the situation. They did a good job of plastering him. It looked pretty awesome, and the, the amount of plaster was on his face, and a straw was sticking out there. He seems to be breathing fine. His color looks good. Um, when I pull it away, it is still stuck to his skin. They want to know if we could remove the mask with some magic instrument, which they th apparently thought we carried, which we don't. If we try to work on this, we could probably injure him more than anything else. So we advised him that the best thing to do would be to take him to the hospital and have it uh, removed with a uh, plaster saw. I was not about to do that. I was not going to sit in a hospital emergency room with 10 pounds of plaster for who knows how long. What about the dentist? They've got to have some kind of small tools or something you could use. The dentist's office. This was a little less embarrassment than a hospital. Smaller office, less people. This is okay. Oh, oh, Eric. Right, right. I was very conscious of the patients that are sitting in the lobby there. Oh, what happened? So I was like, oh, I'm glad this is on my face. At least I can't see them and they can't see my face. Orthodontist Ralph Dwornick had no idea just how well he knew the young man hiding underneath 10 pounds of plaster. Is this, this Eric? Yes, this is Eric. It was definitely on my mind the fact that I had just broken up with the orthodontist's daughter. I was not thrilled by that fact at all to be going to this guy with all these sharp tools and instruments and this big thing on my face. I didn't even know if he'd help me. It almost looked like it had melted right into his forehead. It was basically just almost a tenth of a millimeter time because you didn't know are you going to be wounding him or not. We started dissecting it away from his forehead uh, at the highest point and working down towards his eyes. That's, that's it right there. I just was like, man, this is never going to come off. What's going on? I was holding on to it the whole time, and all of a sudden, boom, it fell free, and I had it in my hand. Boy, I talk about a sigh of relief. <laughs> and I just kind of laid there, glad to be out and be breathing some fresh air. Had a nice big swollen rectangle where the plaster had pulled, and I had big chunks of plaster in my hair. But other than that, there were no permanent scars or any permanent damage done. In the two years since that day, Eric has not managed to live down the incident. Most everybody heard about it, and a couple of kids in one of my classes demonstrated their version of it, and I just had to sit there and just laugh, because it was hilarious to see them do this. I'm glad it didn't scar him for life. If it had, I'd, been, I'd, I'd be a little more ashamed of, of teasing him, but he teases me enough, so he deserved it. Yeah! On the other hand, he may have gotten a lot of sympathy. I imagine he had a lot of sympathetic women around him. Oh, Eric, did it hurt? Was it terrible? <laughs> In the classes that I teach, I always try to bring this up. I try to let people everywhere know that music is very safe for all students of all ages. <laughs> I don't know if I've learned anything that really made me a better artist from it other than research the material you're going to be using a little bit more before you start using it. All, are, all artists suffer for their art sometime in their career. Eric 
just happened to do it a little sooner than anyone had expected. Next. To see your child so helpless and to know that your stupid mistake did this. I lost it. Somebody help me! On August 18th, 1993, Pam Eldred headed out around 9.30 in the morning from her home in Ontario, California, to drive her 13-year-old daughter, Heather, and her younger daughter, Amber, to drill team rehearsal at their school just two blocks away. Pam was always careful when it came to her children's safety. But on that day, she made a decision that left her only with regret. Oh, why are you the Heather wanted to ride in the back of the truck. And it was just one of those mornings where a teenager tends to sometimes get away with a lot by getting in your face, saying, come on, Mom, please, you're so paranoid, you're so overprotective. I've driven for years and years and never been in an accident. I wasn't going far. I wasn't going on any main streets. And I thought we'd be safe. Hey, what about your white tennis shoes? 12-year-old Amber was riding up front with her mother. Heather's sitting in the back there. Can you um, knock on the window and tell her to move? I'm afraid she's going to fall out. Heather! I said to move not so close to the tailgate in case the tailgate fell open or something. Okay, I'm going to have to pull over. My mom told her to just move to the middle or the side. I want to basically be like Heather because she always made my days happier. But she's always been real stubborn. Okay, do you have the candy bag? Yeah, then back with Heather. And what about your partners? Who are you, you going to be in the room with? Um, I have Lacey and Andrea. So you got older girls. Have yeah. you been there before? After drill team, I'll take you. I think Heather needs them too. Okay. Are you all? I looked in the rearview mirror, and, and Heather wasn't where's there. Heather? Heather? God, where's Heather? Amber, where's Heather? Oh, God, she's right there. Heather? Oh, God! I have never known fear, true fear, until that day. Heather? Heather? Somebody help me! She Somebody appeared help me. normal, baby. but unconscious, if, if that me. makes any sense. Baby, there was blood coming out of her nose. But really, at that time, that was all I saw. I didn't, I didn't see you. I didn't cut her. Okay, all she could do was hold me because she was glad that I was okay. She would tell me it's all my fault. I shouldn't have done this. And you know, I didn't want to hear my mom saying that because I was afraid my mom would really go insane. See you, Heather. My kids are almost my life. I love them more than anything. I thought, God, you know. If you're going to take somebody, take me. Don't take her. She's too young. Engine 136, medic engine 133. Code 2 ambulance. Traffic collision. Hey, Pam's close friend, Tammy Marion, happened to be driving by the scene of the accident. Pam! Pam started screaming to me, that's Heather. It's Heather in the street. And she was crying and sobbing. So when I ran up, I said, give them some room so that she could calm down and let them work with Heather and not scare Heather. She's all right. She's all right. Come on, let's sit you down. I was trying real hard to pull myself together in, in case she could hear me. And I lost it. All right, do not move me. She'll be fine. To see your child so helpless and to know also that your stupid mistake did this. It shouldn't happen. It just shouldn't happen. One of the first paramedics on the scene was Mike Kearns from the Ontario Fire Department. She had a large uh, bump on her forehead, and that was the only injury that they had found. My biggest concern was that she had some type of a brain injury. Beyond that, I just don't know. He said, to the best of my knowledge, she has no broken bones, but she's got a bad concussion, and we're going to have to take her to the hospital. Okay. Not responding at all? No. We noticed that her breathing pattern was becoming a little irregular. 
when we went to clear her airway, uh, she had a clenched jaw. And with somebody that has a suspected or possible neck injury, you don't want to be trying to pry her jaw apart. Mercy Caroline paramedic Greg Wardine arrived soon after. What happens with a head injury is the brain swells inside the skull, basically, and all vital functions stop, respirations, heart rate, everything is just stopped. If we weren't able to innovate this girl and get oxygen to her brain, we weren't going to be able to hand anything viable over to the hospital. No, you can't go. Come You'll be able to go later on. They didn't want me to ride with them, and I understood that. They don't need a hysterical mom in the back. We are currently en route to the Loma Linda. Uh, we're getting ready to attempt a nasal innovation on this patient, if that's okay. I was talking to the hospital, trying to talk them into letting me do a nasal innovation to help her breathe. Yeah, he's in. That can be very dangerous with a head injury because if you've got a skull fracture, you can go right into the brain. 133, this is Ontario. Hold off on the nasal intubation. Tell them we really need a community medic. I got back on the radio with them and told them she wasn't responding to anything we were doing. I'm going to get the Lido set up. Can yeah, you give it to us? Go ahead. She was starting to posture, which means that her brain is getting very, very little oxygen. It was about a 20-minute transport time. And we knew that she couldn't wait that long for them to do the procedure there. She's starting to vomit. Let's get her on her side. The posturing was coming more frequently, and we were afraid of the possibility of her vomiting again. So we called back again and said, we really need to do this. If this girl has a chance, we need to do this. We're turned right now. we got our hands full. Um, I'm seeing the patient's teeth are clenched. We'll go ahead and check that again. It had gotten to the point where I was going to go ahead and do it and suffer the consequences when I got to the hospital because it was either done right now or it's not done and she is basically an organ donor after that. 133 Ontario, um, Dr. Rudolph is saying go ahead and nasally intubate her if you're unable to get an oral. Obviously once you get the order, doing it is a whole different story. Fortunately, the tube went right in. 1.5 Lido on board. Okay. You just hope and pray that everything that you did was enough to give the doctors at the hospital a chance. At Loma Linda University Medical Center, 13-year-old Heather Eldred was examined by neurosurgeon David Neerum. I felt that the odds were 100 to 1 against her. She had a massive hemorrhage. Her airway was protected but they had no cranial nerve uh, signs of any activity. So things look very ominous. In my heart, I'm saying, oh, well, we're going to get there and she's going to be mad at us because we weren't there right away. But to see the face on the woman when we gave them our name, I knew, I knew it was really bad. Are you Heather's mom and dad? Yes. I'm Connie. I'm the pediatric trauma coordinator. She took me by the arm and she said, we need to take you to another room. And I just looked at her and said, no, you're not taking me to another room. I know what that means. It's okay. It's just some privacy. It's all right. You need some privacy. It's okay. Heather's father, Richard, had followed the ambulance to the hospital. They uh, told us that they didn't think Heather was going to make it. She was in a uh, very critical condition. Her brain was bleeding. There was a lot of swelling. We have a couple of options. One is we could go in and do surgery. We met with the surgeon. He came out and just basically told us the same thing, that he could do surgery. But there was another option, and I asked him what the option was, and he said, well, we can just wait. I asked him, well, what will happen if we just wait? And he said, well, she'll die. I realize now the reason why he said that is he was so convinced he was going to lose her probably in surgery that it was almost like not worth doing. The only thing I knew how to do at the moment was to pray. Don't take her. Take my strength, okay? You take it with you and you fight really hard because I'm going to be out here fighting with you, okay? I love you, sweetheart. And they told me she was in a really deep coma. But as soon as I told her I loved her, her arm flinched. Now, they tell me that was probably not voluntary, but I don't believe it.
When the doctor came in after the surgery, he, he, he just looked different. He said, well, we've, we got in there and I, I found the bleeder right away and was able to get it under control and her pupils started to dilate and it was like <sighs> he also told me that the paramedic that made the decision to intubate her bought her the time she needed your mom and dad are here every day she would do something that would make us have more hope we'd say wiggle your toes and she'll wiggle her toes or squeeze my hand and she would this one's from your principal at school your vice principal there was a, an immense feeling of goodwill, I felt, coming from other people. Come on, honey. Right about the 12th day, when she started to come to, you. the timing was perfect. Her grandma and grandpa were there. Some of her aunts were there. We were all there. Come on, Heather. I, Heather. I love your baby. I love you, too. Oh, the best gift you can get in the whole world is to see her open her eyes and look right at you and, and you know she's there. They gave her a wheelchair to get around and she refused it. The next day she was pushing it. I was so proud of her. It was like watching her for the first time walking and watching her for the first time spelling her name. She had to relearn everything. Oh, orange. Perfect, right. She Orange. had um, a problem with word retrieval. But she has a real good ability when she notices she's not doing something right to sit back and kind of laugh at herself. When would you have a glass of milk? Oh, I'm not eating cookies. She's not all the way there yet, but she's going to be. It's, I know Heather. She's got that drive. Oh, perfect. <laughs> It's been four months since the accident that changed Heather's life. I just want to be the same how I used to be. <laughs> Amber, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm doing really good in school, except for home economics. I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I want to be a nurse now. <laughs> She's been very good-natured about the whole thing. I like that about Heather. That she can make other people feel comfortable, make them feel happy. That's special. I thank God all the time. But I have my daughter. The paramedic that um, insisted on innovating her, he saved her. I call them the unsung heroes because how many of them get thanked? I mean, how many of them? Do you ever see again? Knowing that you made a difference in that girl's life is, is a special feeling. She's going back to school. She's going to be able to go to her senior prom, be able to drive a car. I'm ecstatic that it worked out the way it did. There's an incredible amount of guilt, and I deal with that every day. I deal with that when she struggles for her words. I deal with that when I see her finally back at drill team and, and trying to catch up with the other girls. My responsibility was to make sure that she was safe at all costs, and I didn't do that. Sometimes I sit back and I look at her and I just start laughing because she'll be doing things that I don't expect her to do, which is silly because with Heather, I should expect the unexpected. I tell her all the time, Heather, you're amazing. You can do whatever you want. We all depend on the quick thinking and bravery of professional rescuers to help us when we're most in need. This series is dedicated to all the men and women in emergency medical services who devote their lives to caring for others. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.
step out of the car, please. <laughs>